Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Jeff Fisher. (laughs) Jared Brandon. Christopher James Graham. And me, Todd Novak. Hi, how are you all doing? So happy to be in front of your ears right now. Um, We are uh, in our little studio here on a super awesome, lovely, sunny Friday afternoon. Um, And uh, we're looking forward to pizza right after this. Mm. (laughs) Not that we're going to try to get this over because we love this more. But um, apologize for a crazy, raspy voice right now. My my usual velvety tones (laughs) are uh, a little... uh, a little rough right now. I think I'm still recouping from the show from last week because I pretty much left it. I left it all on the stage, man. Mm. Like, literally, I was like, I don't know if I can do another song. <laughs> I just went all out. That's awesome. We had a pre-Halloween show, and I um, we wrapped up our set with a, a cover of uh, Misfits Halloween, and uh, that was awesome. That was rad. That was, he's like, okay. I'm doing a Halloween show, like, got to do it, right? Especially after that reunion and everything. Um, so, dudes, let's get to it. What's going on in our music worlds? This, oh, wait. If you haven't had a chance, go check out our new blog section on the website. Hey. TheGuitarKnobs.com. Um, Knobs. I, you know, typically... Uh, when you create your blog posts on your website, it's, it's sort of like one of the first things you do. But I wanted to make sure our site was well stocked with our episodes and guest profiles before that. So I'm going to be retroactively going in and, and sort of doing past post blogs and and also current stuff that we're talking about. Hey, pick up in blog posts. A pick up. You're- in frequency. I'm letting you hang on this Sorry. one. Sorry. <laughs> Just going to keep digging. Yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah, go check that out. Give them a read. The last one we did, or the last one, the first one, <laughs> the one that's up there right now is on uh, uh, about when uh, Jimmy Nielsen from El Rey FX uh, stopped by, and we had a rad time. That's cool fun. dude. Yeah, cool. and um, locked up a couple new uh, interviews today. So those will be coming at us uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I'm stoked about that. Um, anyways, go ahead. Chris, what's up? Um, not a whole lot from last week. Still working. Wrong on, answer on again. The, second week in a row. Sorry. Ding. Ding. Uh, still working on the new mastering studio and uh, making a lot of plans for that. Um, sourcing materials for soundproofing and the like. But... Uh, yeah, that's what's new with me. Sound soundproofing materials. It's actually not soundproofing. It won't be. Most mastering studios aren't really soundproof, but they are acoustically Sorry. treated. So acoustic treatment products. Okay. So so you got your, the trees that you mentioned. Yes, we're going to be using tree bark to mm-hmm. acoustically treat the studio, so that when sound hits it, it explodes in a fiery ball of passion. And How long does tree bark last? Um, decomp- long process. enough for me to. Use it for a long time. You gonna might, shellac it? I might shellac it. We'll see. Shellac it. I have to go to a, a, a mill and ask for custom scraps. What about termites? That's a possibility, um, but it should be pretty evident just looking at it if there's bugs in it. Can you get it pressure treated so that it doesn't have that? I think you could, but that would probably also involve arsenic in it, which is what they use in pressure treated. So I oh. wouldn't want to have that. Expose. I'm probably just going to go super all natural. I might do a light dusting of nitrocellulose lacquer mm. on the yeah. bark, but we'll see. Right. Very, very interesting. I'm excited. I can't wait to actually see it. It's going to sound it's real good. Beautiful. What kind of tree is it going to come I'm from? I'm hoping ash, but I'm not sure. It depends mm-hmm. on what's available because ash has a crazy deep, um, right. especially mature ash, has, has crazy, crazy deep bark grooves. So if sound hits it, it will die. I like a deep crack in the ash. <laughs> hey. Man. Whoa. Whoa. I salute you. That was a great one. I'm going to start marking off Jared here. Oh, man. What the hell? 
That was that was really good. Okay, Timber. This, you lose a piece of pepperoni every time. That happens. <laughs> Check. You don't like that? <laughs> the puns? I love puns so much. No, not the puns. The uh, the oh, I'm, the I'm not even gonna do it. I'm not even gonna do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. And those pepperonis will land on my plate. Mmm. <laughs> That's the penalty. <laughs> That's the only one you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got going on? Okay, kind of a continuation from last week. So I had this crazy bird's eye neck, and um, a friend of mine down the road, Chris O.D., he does uh, guitars, and uh, <clears throat> he refinished this maple neck, and it, it's looking really good. And he put a 50s decal on it. So I ordered this uh, body off of uh, Flea Bay, and uh, it's actually a Mexican-made, an MIM or Mexican-made body. Made in Mexico. That's right. And I got to tell you, everything I've ever had, I, I haven't had that much Mexican-made stuff, but everything I've had, I've always liked. I've never disliked it. In fact... Te gusta? Right. Anyway, yeah, that's, this body's pretty cool. Somebody had taken the original finish off this body and uh, resprayed it in nitro, lacquer, I don't know, the old paint. It's like a seafoam green, blue type of weird color. So Was that an original paint job or? No. No, it was a refinned and thin lacquer. Okay. So like the old 50s style. So is it, kind of, is it a little beat up? or? Yeah, it... it's beat up, but. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind. I don't. I don't really care what they look like as much as I care about how it feels and plays. So, mm. And I, I got it for less that than a couple That used to be the adage years. for getting a wife, too. 160 170 I think I paid. There's an old song <laughs> called, If You Want to Be Happy for the Rest of Your Wife, Better, better Make, make an, an Ugly, ugly Woman Than Your wife. wife. That's a good song. That's really funny. So I got that body today, and I gave it to my buddy that's got the neck, and, and I just got to get a tremolo for it, and... A bridge and all the parts. Put a, put a nut and yeah, I think I have plenty of parts at home. But are you gonna do anything special? Like, as are you just making it like just straight up like just fifties, man? Just factory fifties. Just uh, I don't know. I I don't think I have a guitar that's just plain factory fifties. I'd like to just keep it as a demo guitar for fifties style pickups. That's cool. Hmm. Perfect. Keep there it. You go. Keep it true. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, we got that show coming up. I'm sure we'll be able to find a bunch of good old parts there. Oh, right? yeah. That could. Um, anyways, awesome. Uh, Jefe. Yes, sir. What you got? So, in preparation for today, I was playing around with compression. Mm. Digitally. Done. That's, that's it? <laughs> that's done. Cool. Do we want to talk about anything or not yet? No, I was just I was just kind of checking. Okay. Checking. Um, yeah. So just to explain that probably a little bit more is, of course, I'm all like amp sim nonsense. So. We've got a good spread of things as far as like disciplines and stuff. You're really into the amp sim and not being on stage. Mm-hmm. And not playing with actual like live equipment as much. Not that you don't like that. It's just that's not. Don't do it. Yeah. You, as much. Not, you know, it's hard to sit in my basement by myself a lot. Yeah. Um, as you know, Jared, you agree. Oh, yeah. If you make a mistake, <laughs> nobody knows. Thank you, Auntie Jared. <laughs> Is there any more hot dish? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it's. Um, that is true. If you make a mistake, nobody knows. And that's the the rush and the the murder of doing it live. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I have yet to have a perfect show. And uh, is there such a thing? I mean, there's got to be. Right. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I've had pretty something. damn close to a perfect You'd show. You'd be happy before. with there's, it. There's little mistakes, right? That people in the crowd probably will never notice. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then there's just blatant, terrible, like if you're playing intro to Sweet Child and you flubble that up, everybody will know. But. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to start over. 
It's like, let's try that again. <laughs> it's uh, got to be perfect. That, I've seen that actually, that happened in my very, very first show. <laughs> the very first show I ever did live. I, I think I might have actually mentioned this before, but um, I started playing, you know, I, was, I had all my friends out in the, in the crowd and everything, and, and it was being videotaped, and the, the whole... The whole nine yards I had, I, I was just, I was set. That was my moment. And about the fourth song in was my favorite song. I loved playing the song. It was a really good one. And I started playing a, a, a song. It just wasn't one that we had. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's my and favorite random playing, song I've like, never heard. And I, and I stopped and, and my brain was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and my hand's like, what do you mean? And my brain's like, oh, no. <laughs> and I look over. I've done that. Just to check. And wait, am I crazy? Am I? I'm, something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> and I look over and my, uh, our singer is standing up and he's, he's like primed and ready on the mic. He's leaning forward and he kind of does a slow turn to look at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of crane my head a little back a little further. And our drummer, who's this big, giant, 300-pound beast, He's got his he's got his elbow up on his snare, holding his stick, looking at me <laughs> all belligerently, like, "You idiot! What are you, you what are you doing?" And and then I just I turned to the crowd and and I just stopped and I said, "Just kidding." <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Steve, and all the way in the back, the back of this it's a packed house, he goes, "So we." <laughs> oh no! Oh man! And I got it on tape. It was, it was, it was brutal. I had a similar experience one time. I was playing at a wedding, and I missed my cue for to begin playing the song "Beautiful Day" by myself at a wedding. And I and by miss my cue, I mean I was like five minutes early, and oh. I didn't didn't know about it. And finally, you're playing with a track. Uh, no, I was like, it was like an acoustic version with like delay on it, it's pretty heavily affected, and I got into it and kind of glanced over. I was like a minute in, and the whole wedding party was just staring at me, and the minister sort of leaned forward on the mic and said, <laughs> oh, "I'm sorry, Chris, uh, I'm not quite ready for you." Yet. Oh, the call you got a call out, oh, but it was beautiful. Oh, I can't wait to hear it, it was, again. It was yeah. awkward, and I was really mature, so I leaned forward and said, "That's when they told me to go," and. Yeah. Oh, that oh, was super uh, awkward. That oh. was ugly. That's ugly. Yeah, nineteen year old. But it's not my Graham. fault. My yeah, worst. Their fault. Somebody else did it. My worst train wreck was a violin solo. I played the vi- I play the violin mm. with your but guitar. Was, no, <laughs> that would be rad. <laughs> my mommy was accompanying me. Uh, the da na 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 song. I forgot the song. But uh, I started playing it, and I just started squeaking, and I was at church. Fire I Bumblebee. was in front of like 500, 600 people. And I'm a teen, a, a young teenager, maybe 10 or whatever. That's fair to least, right? 13. Yeah, that's what it is. Yep. All right. I knew it was something Violin, like that. man. You that is the most unforgiving instrument. And I'm just, oh, yeah. I was devastated. And my mom just did the dun 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 <laughs> She, she, so she better. bailed you out of it? And she said, let's start over. You can do it, you know? Yeah. And I got through it. I, I did it perfect after that. Yeah. So I, it, it was crazy. You know, it's funny. The, the, crowd, the crowds are usually pretty forgiving. Um, you know, at, our, at, our, at this last show we did, we had a, the, the band that was opening for us. They had our new drummers. I think it was like his second gig. Actually, it might have even been his first gig. His first or second gig. I'm not really sure. But... Um, they started trying to play a song, and they tried like three times, and it went, and they restarted three times, Ooh. and and then they got it, and they kicked it. But you know, I think a lot of times people who are at shows are also musicians. So you're, you, you know, there's <laughs> the bass player. He, he, you could tell like he he just kind of had um, I don't want to say bad form. That's not the right word, but maybe he he adapted it in a, a a a not advantageous way of playing mm. that he just stuck with but that wasn't going to be able to maintain over a long time so i mean he's 
his whole arm was was pushing the oh, pick. Oh yeah, you know? and and it was just like you're like, oh come on, buddy, get through it, get through it, get through. It. You know, so uh, you know we're rooting for him. We're just sending good vibes, but you also are like, oh ouch, ah. mm. that that kind of hurts. He was having some treble. Oh, oh man, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, oh, that's two pepperonis. No. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't the uh-huh. normal one. That's a new one. That's a, that's a different one. <laughs> All right. So um, for as for me, um, I was super happy because uh, we're I'm uh, building a new pedal and I had a pain in the butt trying to get. Um, I was trying to get two kind, two different kinds of dual gang pots, um, which is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be because I wanted there were very specific features on those mm. on those pots, um, and uh, um, and it, I was, something just freaked me out because like I just saw the screens shut down right now and I was like <laughs> oh no. Um, no, they were just kind of going to sleep because they were bored of my story. Apparently, the screens were. So, anyways, those came in yesterday, and I posted a nice little thing on Instagram, and I'm super excited to, to get started on those. And I bought more than I need because if this works well, I might build a couple of them. Mm. So we're gonna we're gonna do one of them as a giveaway for sure. So we'll be giving cool. that away to the guitar pedal, uh, the guitar knobs. Uh, pedal fiend association which there is none but hmm. all the listeners out there pretty much anybody worldwide that we can actually ship the pedal to which may i don't know within I've ohio never shipped, yeah within within the country but if we can ship a worldwide we we will certainly try i don't know hmm. there, what the limitations on i know there's like you know lead problems and stuff like that that other pedal shippers encounter i don't make them professionally so I don't know what to expect. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Indeed. We are also going to have another uh, awesome giveaway sponsored by Brandon Wound Pickups. We're going to give away a set of, uh, a, a set of tele- why don't you tell them, tell them what they're going to win, Johnny. To be the, honest, the I don't remember. Telecaster Pickups. Telecaster Pickups. Oh, yeah. I You'll win this. some really nice Telecaster Pickups. I just could have said that. What else is it about? <laughs> <laughs> Not in that Do you voice. Remember that? I think they were, you call them, the, they were the hot, the vintage wound. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now I know. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're uh, wound with some really old wire. The wire is like 25, 30 years old, but it's still really good wire. What's, and, the, uh, what's the purpose of doing that? I don't know. It just people get excited about it because it's, it's, it's older it's, wire because it's vintage spec. <laughs> wire has. I'm trying to make it clear that you're not. You just go like, well, I just had some old wire lying around. Yeah. No, actually, actually I have a lot of this wire. There was a which a, you got specifically because you, you need to wind. Right. Wind well, what I do specs. is it, sometimes I'll look around for some new old stock wire just to have in my arsenal because um, there's a lot of guys that believe wire was manufactured maybe better or a, a different way and different enamel and or it, something. It, it, well it may cause a anomaly if it's just different you know mm-hmm. wound hand wound or whatever it, it's all different mojo and, and folklore and whatever and <clears throat> yeah i mean i really like having that stuff and it's handy to um have this stuff around especially for rewinds if somebody has a mm. a pickup from you know, a certain era, and I have wire from the same era, they're going to be super happy, mm-hmm. you know, because then they'll feel, oh, well, I'm, I get the, it's the, a better match. The original thing. I'm not getting yeah. a new pickup that's meant to feel old. It's like legit, all the parts are old. That's cool. And so that's what they'll be winning. Yes, they will. I that's love that. Really nice pickups. That's an awesome setup. And they look great too. I mean, you know, Telecaster pickups are Telecaster pickups, but these look pretty sweet. And they're going to sound really good too. Yeah. I believe it. Um, so, so that's all the new stuff this week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, oh, I will say, uh, I, at the, at the show that we did, I just want to throw this out there for anybody that, that has encountered this. So I, I kind of went, um, I didn't want to put tape. Okay. So I had a pick holder on my mic stand, the kind that you put the, you know, the picks in the little rubber thingamabobber. 
And I left it at one of the last shows I did. Ah, so that like, happens so much. Doggone it. it. Just Right? And then I was like, okay, I'll just put tape on the mic stand. I'm like, no, because I got to grab the mic stand too a little bit. So I totally uh, did old school, like, Van Halen style, just rolled up a piece of duct tape and st- stuck it to the butt end of my body, my guitar body. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. And uh, just stuck a couple picks on there. It was great. It worked out. <laughs> duct tape. Who knew? There you go. <laughs> so I might just go that route again from, from now on. I got plenty of duct tape. So anyways. So that's that. Okay, listen, this episode, which you are listening to, which says something along the lines of, as yet untitled, working title, compression pedals. What's up with those? (laughs) Or something to the like. (laughs) Um, uh, And it's not just compression pedals, but there is a huge, I think, uh, a a huge. Ginormous. What? Yeah. Ginormous. Ginormous. A huge, ginormous. Um, void of understanding or at least confusion as to what compression actually does. Mm -hmm. And especially because when you're talking about compression in a mix versus compression on a pedal board or compression on both of those working together, that's when it starts to get really, really, really tricky. Starting with like the fundamentals of what compression does is already misleading. They, they just named it wrong. I think, I feel like it's named wrong. What should based, it be on, called? based on what we're going to learn. Cause Chris, Chris is going to kind of lead our discussion in compression today. And, um, you know, he, as a, as somebody who is a professional masterer, audio masterer, <laughs> he's got to use a lot of different, forms of compression Mm -hmm. Um, as guitar players we use compression in slightly different ways but often do achieve probably the same thing yeah um so it's just a it's just a bit of a of a crazy thing and i will i will throw this out there um that pedal show on youtube has done i think up to date two shows on compression he does one, they do one called Compression 101, which is the second show. The first one, they were just talking about where to put it in a pedal chain. And, I mean, if you guys haven't watched that channel, it's fantastic. Those two guys are outstanding. I love watching their show. I always learn so much. And um, the uh, they, they helped me to understand a lot of that, but I think there's a lot more to talk about, too. So, anyways... With that, I'm going to hand over to Chris, and then we're going to um, pepper him with questions. Gotcha. After. Yeah, the more I think back and forth we have, I think the better for this conversation, because um, mm. we're at a little bit of a disadvantage. You know, like you said, Todd, um, compression is difficult to understand, and I'm, I've am i been thinking about how to explain this, um, and I'm, I, th- I think I'm going to sing a little bit. So brace yourselves for that, just to demonstrate All right. in the future. So I'm nervous about that. But so <laughs> let me start by saying, um, yeah, what I do as a master and engineer, just a little explanation there. Uh, so I compress for a living, and uh, making uh, things sound good while you compress them is always give or take. Um, and you have to set the compressor just right to uh, have it sweeten the source material rather than just destroy it and make it sound terrible. So it's like any other tool, you know, a hammer, if you use it correctly, is very precise. If you use it wrong, it breaks everything. So oh, good um, analogy. Indeed. So um, when you're playing guitar, I think, I think, you know, we need to talk about what good guitar playing is to start with. And in my opinion... Uh, good, okay, wait. So when you're saying good guitar playing, you're saying good guitar playing for, not from, from an a artist. subjective... Yeah, from a, like, you listen to someone play, and you're like, oh, my God, they're amazing. What three ingredients do they possess? Okay. And I would say those three ingredients are they're playing the right notes at the right time at the right volume. And those are the three things that if you are missing any one of those things, you are not playing the guitar well. 
And what makes compression such an interesting conversation is that there's nothing you can do, uh, there's no device you can use to help you play the right notes. And there's no device you can use within reason to play the right at the right time, but a compressor can help you play at the right volume in some instances, if used correctly. So a compressor is really, it's a type of robot. It's a type of auto um, matron, I guess we'll say. That, uh, <laughs> an automatron? An automatron. That's hmm. probably the wrong word. Well, I don't know. Auto, sounds I'm trying to cool. sound fancy. But so when you're playing uh, most styles of music, especially uh, with rhythm, um, there's this desire to, I want to play the same volume for this song mm -hmm. uh, or this section of the song. And a compressor can be very helpful because it can uh, help control um, your volume on a micro level. It's as if there's a robot sitting there on a volume pedal listening to you Two playing. robots, really. Two robots uh, sitting there on a volume pedal, and they are turning you up and down extremely quickly in order to make sure that you are playing at a more consistent volume level. And then you can communicate to these robots through the knobs and the pedal and tell them, um, speed up, slow down, turn me up down, turn me up more or turn mm -hmm. me down more. And yeah. So, so at a, at the core, most basic level, it's a robot. It, it is a robot with two, pe two foot pedals. <laughs> We're going to complicate the hell out of this super easy idea that it's taking your managing your lows. So turning up your well, lows. Well, let me let me dive and, into that. It's actually one pedal. Um, okay. But if used properly, it sounds so, so you don't have a robot that's turning you up and then a separate one that's turning you down. You only have one that's turning you down. But if uh, let me so let's circle back to that. Let's put a pin in that. Okay. It, that's going to be make a lot more sense in about two minutes. Okay. Um, so the way a compressor works, and this is the part of the show where I get to sing for you guys, mm. so Woo. bear with me. Um, I'll try to not make this lame. Um, but a compressor it uh, functions based on something called a threshold. And a threshold is this sort of invisible line, and once you get louder than this invisible line, then the compressor starts to do stuff. If you are below this invisible line, the compressor does nothing. So it's possible uh, if you have a compressor pedal and you're using it on your guitar rig that you might have thought to yourself, it's not doing anything. And that's, if it's not set up properly, then yes, it's not supposed to do anything until stuff gets to a certain volume level. So um, if I were to, I'm going to sing one, two, three, four, five. And if, if that went something like this, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm getting louder as I count higher, that's without compression. If I turn the threshold, say the threshold's at six. If I turn the threshold down so it was below the four, then it might sound something more like this, depending on how the, this pedal was set up. One, two, three, four, five. So now the four and the five are much more similar in volume. And this is really useful for whether you're playing rhythm or whether you're playing a lead um, because it makes everything fat and everything thick. And if you turn it all the way down, you know, to say right after the one, then suddenly it sounds more like one, two, three, four, five. Everything is basically the same volume. Uh, all things being equal and me being a better singer, it would, it would be more effective. But um, so now if you increase, uh, what I did there was I compressed after the one, two, three, and then four and five, but I also added gain after that so that the one was now as loud as the five. So I turned everything up and then compressed above the one, and that made the one the same volume as the five, but then it turned down the two, turned down the three a lot, turned down the four a whole lot, turned down the five a ton, which made everything about the same volume. Mm -hmm. So the, the big variable, and you don't really have to worry about this with an electric guitar pedal, you know, the most popular compressor pedal without a doubt, is probably the MXR Dynacomp. It's kind of the classic. And there's a lot of variations on that. Many, many, many compressor pedals are basically clones of that um, and slight mods. And there's others out there as well. Um, but for, for that pedal, it's basically one knob. And as you turn it up, um, you get gain and 
compression. Mm -hmm. So uh, that gain makes it so that the quieter notes are louder, and that compression makes it so that the louder notes are quieter. Right. So well, that's what I was talking about with the. the well, I exactly. But the, I think one of the biggest confusions that comes in is that people think, well, compression makes my quieter notes sound louder. That's not actually true. Compression only makes your louder notes sound quieter, but because you're using gain in conjunction with compression, it's which bringing everything. It's up. bringing everything up. Ah, exactly. Ah. So yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt. Yes, please, please. <clears throat> I have a noise gate at home. I think it's a Rocktron. Nothing fancy. That sky, that blue Rocktron. And it's a, a noise gate. And I, I asked my buddy, I said, hey, uh, you know, what do I do so I don't get squealing and all that kind of crap when I play live? Oh, you got to get a rock john. And, and it's basically one knob. It's the opposite of a compressor in, in many ways. So the threshold, instead of moving from the ceiling down, moves from the floor up. And yeah. it functions in much the same way in that once the signal drops below the threshold, then it begins to turn down. The higher I turn it up, the the more unnatural sound I'm getting, and I don't like it. Well, and the reason for that is that you want that threshold to sit below where you play. Uh, so just it's a, at, right above the noise floor. Okay. As you turn that up, if it gets if that noise gate, that threshold, and this is the important concept here gets to the point where it's above your quietest notes, it'll start messing with your quieter notes, and it'll leave your louder notes alone. So the, no the noise gate's a perfect thing to bring into this conversation because it's threshold-based in the same way that the compressor is. A compressor makes something quieter once it's above the threshold. A noise gate makes something quieter once it's below the threshold. Ah. So, mm -hmm. so a one-two punch on a telly would be uh, uh, typically tellies have more inherent noise anyways. So you're using a noise gate um, you could take or a noise suppressor. When you're not playing. Right. Could kill that that sort of white noise that's coming through. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then your compressor is going to take the, the way that you uh, attack the guitar and equalize that all out yeah. to a degree. So if you were you know, going to play the Star Spangled Banner on the guitar and you went do 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 and you get that last note crazy Beautiful. loud, right. so ugly, the compressor will keep that note from being crazy uh, pants. Ungainly. <laughs> oh. so, uh, so do you think people when they are buying a compressor they're thinking, oh I want all my sound to be the same across the board or are they thinking well, I want sustain there's there's two reasons to use compression on an electric guitar um, and I think that's primarily the conversation we're having here let's do it one is to tighten the the sound of the guitar and you, you get a much uh, more consistent volume but you also get a fatness from this um, the other thing um, and this is related to our excuse me our noise conversation as well too is as you compress more you're going to get more gain. Um, that's just the way the Dynacomp works and almost every other compressor pedal out there. Um, as you turn up the gain and compress your louder notes, your noise floor will get louder. And as a result of that, that also can create sustain. So if it's essentially feedback. So if you've got your amp up super loud um, and you put your electric guitar right in front of it, it's going to feedback like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, if As you walk away and you turn up the compressor pedal, that's essentially making your guitar way louder, so it feeds back a lot more, and you can get that infinite sustain, you know, sort of uh, Steve Vai thing. So if you are playing at a lower volume and want more pseudo-amp dynamic, right, to where it's going to make it sound like the amp's being pushed... Um, well, and here's an uh, that's a that's a great road for us to go down. What makes compressors really great if you're using natural amp distortion and you're trying to to push the break up is that distortion is also threshold based. Yes. Because because uh, there, there's a certain point where if you put too many volts into the system it starts to 
fall apart. And instead of a nice, beautiful sound wave, it chops the top of it off. Right. It basically makes plateaus on now, the sound is, wave. Is that because, uh, like, if you're playing if you're playing slower or softer, you've got there. There's time for the speaker essentially to to you know move. If you're turning it way up and it's just all like yeah, right? nothing but plateaus. Has, right, so it, it has less dynamic range. Yes, dynamic movement range. Dynamic being the difference between loud notes and quiet notes. Right. Yeah. So it's just kind of all fluttering out there on the on the edge and not as as big yeah. of movement giving you that that sound um dynamic right and a compression pedal if you're using if you're if you're playing at a lower volume but want that sort of push you can do that with a pedal yes, yes. and well, correct and you can let me explain that so distortion if anybody if any of you guys have ever used a really nice tube amp mm -hmm. and you oh pull, yes you tell me about that indeed. I love it. If you yeah. plug a, a guitar into it, a really, really, really great tube amp, um, you can play it lightly and it'll be clean. And then you bite into it a little bit with the pick and suddenly full on distortion. That's happening because you're crossing the threshold where you run out of headroom in the amp mm -hmm. and it begins to distort. Now, a compressor can be really interesting before an amp like that because it can help you control that dynamic before where you start to to distort. So, um, and we're kind of getting more esoteric here, but it can be really useful when you're playing rhythm to, to, if you're thinking, boy, you know, sometimes I'm getting excited in a show, I'm just playing the guitar a little too aggressively and the amp starts to fall apart a little bit, it starts to fart, mm. you know? And so the compressor can be nice because you can say, hey, compressor, um, here's the threshold I want. I really don't want to play a whole lot louder than this point. And you can keep yourself pinned up against that point mm -hmm. where you're almost breaking up on an amp, that real nice sweet spot where it's not full on distortion, but there's elements of clean tone and elements of breakup right. when you play. So a compressor, that's hard to do. Um, especially with a, a not as nice amp, you know, if you're working with like a, an Epiphone, uh, you know, one of those cheaper Epiphone tube amps, they're a little harder to do, to, to stay in that sweet spot than say like a really nice Marshall or a really nice vintage Fender or uh, one, of, one of those handmade amps. And that's based on basically the, the volume that the amp can push yeah. and when it, before it starts clipping, like a low wattage amp versus a high wattage amp, right? And, well, and there's a, a degree of, of how um, wide, shall we say, is the threshold of breakup. Right. So on some amps, it's like instantaneous, instantaneous, full on, ridiculous, unusable distortion. And on, I, I used to have a small little five watt Epiphone combo that was like that, where you would try to get right in that spot and then you dig a little bit and the speaker was just, you know, <laughs> Like it, it didn't sound cool. Yeah, it stinks. Yeah, uh, but uh, speaker uh. speaker selection. I mean, regard we're we're starting to go down a, a rabbit hole yeah. with this. But speaker selection, which I just spent a whole lot of time learning about, um, uh, can really play into that. Even if you have an awesome amp. Yeah. So yeah, uh, loads and loads of variables. But you started to go down something I I want to press on. Um, one of the questions that I pre had was what types of music or sound benefits um, do you get from most compressors? Well, and here's the thing. If, if you're listening to this podcast and you're saying, eh, compression, let me ruin your life here. You've probably never heard music that didn't have a compressor on it before in your life. I'd be, if you have it, it wasn't on the radio or TV or in a movie. Compression is uh, easily one of the most widely used audio tools, period. So um, it's, a, it's sort of like trying to build a house without a hammer um, if you're trying to not use compression, and on, on at least on occasion. From a recording or production standpoint. From a recording or production standpoint, right. or I, I'm a total nerd, so take this with a grain of salt, or even from a guitar standpoint. There's mm -hmm. gonna be a song 
in your set right. that's going to require compression to sound right. Let me ask you something right off, just right off my little pea brain here. <laughs> when did they start using live compression in the Oh, music good industry? question. I see that. Oh, you know what? You get one of your pepperonis back. Yes. There we go. Yes. That was a good That's question. That's what I want to know. What, <laughs> you know, well, I'm not as much of a historian on this stuff, but I would say early 70s. Um, but compression's been around since the 30s or 40s. It's a it's a pretty old technology. Whoa. So, uh, but but again, when when we think, "Oh my gosh, I love that tube amp." It just punches, you know, like if you're looking at a blues breaker or a, you know, a twin reverb or a plexi or what what have you, what you like about it is the way it compresses. It's a, a good tube amp naturally compresses in a much more pleasing, punchy way mm. than, say, like a crate solid stamp, state amp from 1994 or something like that. Right. And... Uh, so, and one of the one of the things there too um, is on a really great boutique or vintage tube amp. It probably has a tube rectifier, so the the power supply of it is also vacuum tube. And as you begin to distort with it, it it starts to sag, and the it starts to run out of juice. That also is compression. Um, so when you listen to a really great amp. Not only does it break up nice as a result of the way tubes compress when they distort, but also as a result of the power supply. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, so. You you brought up a point that um, I, I think this is where some of the myth stuff comes in. This is like I play mostly rhythm, so I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm playing I'm playing pretty consistently. I dig in, you know, occasionally and stuff. But I, I I've always felt like compressors are used for uh, guys who are doing lead. Well, yeah. Um, by and large, you're absolutely right. Um, playing lead is a lot harder to play the right volume of note at the right time, especially on some of the more, you know, like a Strat, in my opinion, is way harder to be precise volume-wise than I would say a Les Paul mm -hmm. or something like that. And some people might disagree. That's just me as a guitar player. But it can get unruly uh, really fast on a brighter guitar. Yeah, isn't a, a, a humbucker pickup kind of a compressor in itself? Um, because of the th way it's... That's, pro that's a little beyond my expertise, but... Um, we only had a pickup guy here. Oh, yeah. Under I mean, compression. It's well, possible. <laughs> not only that, but I I actually listened to that, um, that compression video. That oh, yeah? You, that you had... It was yeah. great. It's really interesting. And I remember that in there. I'm like... A humbucker is coming. Well, I could see that because it's. I don't know. Maybe I can't. I gotta look into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm serious, man. I'm, that's why I asked you. Like this, you know, does it get? You know, yeah, I don't. Know. Know. Maybe I. Can't. I don't know the answer. To that I don't know question. everything there is to know about pickups. I never claimed to, but yeah, oh, that's kind of interesting. So it yeah. feels more compressed to me. Well, yeah. You know, like it. It. It feels a lot easier to control uh, a humbucker. I think that control piece is the part that I was going to touch on, which is. When using a compressor, there's a belief that it does make the guitar easier to play. Yes. So yes, it does. Is that because all your notes are the same volume, so you can you know fly through scalar things a lot? Yeah, like a little more forgiving. Is what yeah, you're it's more forgiving. Yeah. And and when I say, um, but what makes it more forgiving? Is it that everything is at the same I think volume? So. Yeah, I think it's you know you need to play the right note at the right time at the right volume, and if that's those are that's a lot of multitasking for us guitar players and you know it's virtually every instrument um but a compressor is this amazing unique effect in that it is a robot that can augment your own intelligence uh and gifting and talent to help you with that third component that are you playing um at the right volume mm. so um it's tricky because you have to give uh this robot the right parameters um, with which to make those decisions. But it does, in the strictest sense of the word, it is a robot because it does make decisions within the parameters that you give it. Mm -hmm. And that's what a robot does. So... Um, okay, can, another question. Yeah. All right. So let's say um, you have... Uh, you're, you're playing almost a, like a... Okay. I have... In one of my sets that I do uh, for one of the bands... Um, I'm playing, a, it, it's acoustic-ish sounding, 
um, at times. And in order to... Every rose has its thorn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. that's my favorite. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but thanks for that. Um, you no, know, but I, I don't want to sacrifice a lower, like if I need to, if I need to kind of quiet it down a little bit or something, if I'm doing that, I don't want to sacrifice that low Your stuff. Your ability to be dynamic. Right. But I also don't, when, when you're playing that like cleaner strumming, you know, stuff, it's Johnny Cash type stuff. It's like, I also don't want to hit crazy stuff and make people go like, ah, that sucks. So I, I, I actually got the compressor that's sitting on the table just for that and then realized, man, I really don't know how to use this damn thing. <laughs> well, this, we're looking at basically an MXR Dynacomp clone. And yeah. uh, this type of pedal would mostly be used with lead stuff but a little bit of it just a, a, a subtle amount of it i just had it just on a touch well and what i would recommend for people that are experimenting with compressors is you have to know how to hear compression yeah. when it happens to be able to use it properly so you have to develop your ear like you would with, with anything yeah. else so what i recommend is to is to get a guitar out and just start going chunk 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 and slowly turn up the compressor right until you start to hear and if you've got a looper pedal loop up a chunk 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 put the compressor pedal after that and slowly begin to turn it up oh that's a great idea until you start to hear that's a fantastic idea all oh, right I do see that what do, it's tell, doing. tell us that one more time yeah so i would get a looper pedal if you've got a looper pedal <laughs> well you're it's easier to remember things <laughs> um go you know get it so it's doing you know, even if you could do it with just chunk, 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 you know, on a guitar, or you yep. could, you'd be like, do, 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 Gilligan's Island. You know, or there's a really bad impersonation of a Jimi Hendrix thing that I got wrong. Anyways, yeah. But so you get a lead part or rhythm part. Get that going. Whatever you're mostly playing. On the loop. And then after the loop, plug it in a little compressor pedal, turn it all the way to the left, which is going to be off. And then begin to slowly turn it up and listen for how it changes the tone. Okay. And what you have to develop is so that you can hear that's compressed or it's not compressed. Yeah. And uh, or that's compressed too much or that's compressed too little. But it really takes a lot of experimentation. And you honestly could know nothing about compression, the thresholds and the ratios and all that stuff. If if you sit down with a loop and you experiment, I'm going to slowly turn each of the knobs in this compressor yeah. and see if I like it. Just like any other effect, Yeah, you gotta sit there and goof around with it and say, do I like this or do I not yeah. like this? It's just difficult to do it while you're playing guitar. It is very difficult to do that while you're playing guitar. <gasps> while we are talking about the different components, let's actually walk through. So you also have a Wampler. Yes, my favorite compressor pedal is the Wampler Ego Compressor. It is awesome. Okay. So, um, Let's walk through each of the knobs on that. Yeah. So if you guys, uh, you know, if you're driving or whatever. Um, imagine if you will. Imagine if you will. A beautiful blue sparkle pedal uh, that's got five knobs on it and one switch. Really, really nice one. And uh, basically there's the sustain knob on the far bottom left, which is essentially the same knob that you see on the MXR Dynacomp. It's the com comp knob. And as you turn that up, it lowers the threshold at which it's going to compress, but it also adds gain at the same time. In a studio compressor, very few compressors do that at the same time. Usually you have to add gain separately from adjusting the threshold. So, um, and there's definitely exceptions to that. 1176s and whatnot, you know, or don't. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, I, I digress. So, um, a lot of times on some compressor pedals, you'll have an additional gain. Um, that's a volume knob that's on the far Would left. Would that also side. be level in some cases? Yes, level or gain, level or, gain or trim volume. or whatever. And uh, so you've got that going on. Most compressor pedals will have some sort of tone knob as well, which is exactly what it sounds like. Tone knob or EQ or something. Yeah, or EQ. As you compress, a lot of times you're going to warm up the signal. It's going to take out the brightness and, and make it chunkier. So some people like the ability to, on the compressor pedal, be able to brighten it up a okay. little bit. And um, it's definitely very useful. One of the things that's unique on the Ego compressor um, is it has an attack 
knob. Now, the attack knob um, is very fascinating, and what it does is it slows down how fast the compressor grabs something and turns it down. So, um, I get to sing again. If I were gonna go, one, two, three, four, five, and I get louder and louder and louder as I turn the compressor down, let's say below the four, one, two, three, four, five, that four and that five are the same volume as about the three. Um, if I slow the attack down, it might sound something more like this. One, two, three, four, five. And it begins to slow down how fast it grabs that note. And that can be very useful, especially in a rhythm scenario, um, because you might want more chunk. Uh, when like you're, Ringo's drums. Bingo. More chunk or more punch. Or you might want a really plucky lead sound right. where you hear that pick really loud and then it begins to grab the note after uh, that. Uh, so that's a very interesting use for that. Yes, you can. I like that. Definitely. And this is what we're talking about is the use of compression to change the envelope of a note. So uh, let me demonstrate what I mean by envelope. An envelope, this is no envelope. Ba. That's just a single note that goes like this. Um, if I were to decay at the end of the note, that would go ba. I'm changing the envelope, basically the volume of a single note. Um, the attack is super useful for changing the very beginning um, of that note. So I could go ba. Right. Or I could go ba. But all these different, you know, for any of you guys that have messed around with the synths before. It's very, it's a very synthy concept. So having like a rack mount, and you want to do like a reverse guitar, you, do you ever hear the see the reverse effect on mm -hmm. a guitar? That's just, so basically they're using compression to make that effect. Not usually, no. Um, they're usually using delay. Bro, uh, you just lost a pepperoni yeah. for that one. But it's similar. <laughs> it's similar. That, that's, oh, it's your fault. You were. I gotta get extra pepperoni. <laughs> you were right in that. You were uh, the reverse effect. Yeah. switches the direction of the envelope. When you when you make the note backwards, the yeah. envelope is now backwards. So instead of dang, it's... Well, they're using that yeah. technology. Right? Yeah, you're, you're messing with envelopes. So I'm in the realm. Of yeah. My yeah. Okay. Half so th this attack knob, and <laughs> most studio compressors also have a release knob. Um, uh, occasionally, if you're dealing with something crazy like the Keeley compressor or... Um, you know, some other fancy doodad, you know, guitar pedals. I think the Keeley has a release knob on it. Um, I might be wrong about that. But in, anyways, both both the attack and the release mess Got with attack the... attack and clipping. I know that. Gotcha. Um, the... Uh, There's some... Comp the, the, the super duper fancy huge one, I'm sure, has a release button oh, I mean, on it. Yeah, they got, they yeah. got one that's... Like three hundred bucks for like yeah, three. and if you're seeing but, here's but the standard four knob is sustain level attack and clipping ah exactly yeah so um, but some of the fancier ones if you if you were looking at a computer here some of them have lights on them you know like a volume meter yeah and I think this is worth bringing up if if you are using a compressor in a studio scenario or you're using a compressor that has those light knobs on it most people won't um, from guitar pedal standpoint mm -hmm. those knobs indicate how much it's t or those lights indicate how much the compressor is turning down the signal i see so bottom line um nugget of truth here if you're using a compressor in GarageBand or logic or pro tools or whatever and you're goofing around just don't do more than three or f between three and five db of gain reduction and you'll, it'll probably sound decent even if yeah. your attack is wrong and your release is wrong and your ratio uh I'll talk about ratio here in just a second. So long as you're as you're not doing too many dB of dB is the measurement of volume. So long as you're only seeing like negative two or negative three or negative four or negative five, you're going to be okay. If you're looking at a compressor that's showing you negative twenty four, that's going to sound bad. Yeah, almost all the time. Um. All right, and let's see. Um. Ratio. Ratio. Yeah. So ratio, you usually don't need to worry about with guitar pedals. If if you've got a Dynacomp at home that you bought and are thinking boy, I, maybe I should examine this a little bit more because Chris said all music ever has been compressed. Um, and that's, you know, definitely in the past 30 years, you probably have never heard anything that was released to any public acclaim that wasn't compressed in some way. 
um, with the exception maybe of some classical music. Um, so ratio, um, and this is it's going to get technical. You don't need to understand this um, to use compression, begin to use compression effectively. Um, ratio is once you hit the threshold, how much do you want stuff to turn down? So what I've been demonstrating is essentially an infinity ratio. It's essentially limiting. So when I'm singing and I go one, two, three, four, five, I'm basically demonstrating limiting. The four and the five are the same volume as the three. Ratio as you as you turn it down, you know, say two to one or three to one, is for every one, so three to one is for every three dB that we go up above the threshold, only turn it up one decibel. I see. Um, if it's eight to one, for every eight decibels that we go up, only go up one, one decibel. That's post. good stuff. I had no idea. Yeah, it's it's complicated. So that's kind of built into most guitar pedals, right? That all that some it, of that some of it can some be, of yeah. these other knobs. The that ratio you get. is preset on most on right. most guitar pedals. But when you're talking like a studio level compressor, you get more refinement because you get more access yes. to the the robot. Yes. So, and no matter what you're doing, um, you should be looking at the gain reduction meter, those little red lights or that, that needle that jumps backwards mm -hmm. compared to normal needles. And basically what you're looking for is to make sure it's not jumping back too far, that you're not seeing a ton of gain reduction. And if you are seeing a ton of gain reduction, you can, you can do several things to compress less. One, and the most simple way is to turn the threshold up to make it so that louder notes are, are, aren't going to hit that threshold. The other thing you can do um, is you can turn your ratio down so that, oh, whoa, geez. that was a guitar pedal. <laughs> I threw the guitar pedal across the room. <laughs> hey, Todd, you might, I, I in post, you might want to use a compressor. Oh, I was just going to say that. For that. Hey. <laughs> so it's not too loud for our listeners. Whoops. So, um, but as you turn that ratio down, um, you're, it's the compressor is going to be more gentle. Now, let me talk about one more thing um, with compression that's super cool. And uh, as a mastering engineer, I'm just obsessed with this. When I'm talking to people about how to mix their music better, it's one of the, as a mastering engineer, it's a thing I do a lot. Um, somebody will send me a project and I'll call them back and say, hey, I love the songs. Uh, here's maybe some mix changes I might recommend. Um, one of the things I bring up that's little known about compression is something called parallel compression. And essentially all that means is um, you take the signal you want to compress, you split it in half, you compress half the signal, and you don't compress the other half of the signal, and then you combine them back together. This is sort of like a two amp thing. Yes, sort of like a two amp thing. Or two different speakers in one cabinet, Jeff. Yeah. Not even similar. There you go. But, Not uh, even close. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, when you do that, compression becomes a lot more forgiving. And you can all you can do some things that you couldn't get away with when you are uh, blending the two signals together. The Wampler Ego Compressor has a blend knob on it that does just that. Um, I'm I'm completely blanking on this, but if as you turn it all the way to the left, I believe that's pure compression. So it's a wet or dry. Yeah, wet or dry. As you turn it all the way to the right, that's no compression. So if you have a Wampler Ego Compressor and you say this thing doesn't do anything, it might be because you you've Blended, you've you know used the blend knob to disable the compressor. So, so it's not it's not that it's not compressing. You're just not allowing the compressor the to compression compress. to go to through. be mixed back in. Right, yeah, right. it's essentially you've got two faders on your board. Your guitar comes in. One of those channels is being compressed. The other isn't. And yeah. you're adjusting the ratio of those two channels right. together. So that can be super useful because you could squash a signal. Squash means compress a lot, um, but then only mix in a little bit of it and use mostly dry, uncompressed signal. What mm -hmm. that does is it creates essentially a concrete tone foundation mm. underneath whatever you're doing, and you just get massive thickness. That's and a cool. little bit of dynamic control as well, but all of your natural dynamics are still there. You just have this like girthy, so thick. It's, it's like thing. double tracking, except Exact. Exact. And so if you if you think about perfect example, you think about a vocal, a pop vocal on the radio, an Adele or a Rihanna or a John Mayer. Or, I'd prefer not to, but if, you, you know. Can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, I mean, <laughs> you name it. I mean, even freaking uh, 
like the Beatles, uh, Motown, Led Zeppelin, you name it, there's a pretty good chance that there's some parallel compression on their vocal. When you think about, oh my gosh, that vocal sounds so girthy, Mm. a lot of that, um, a large ingredient in that for the past, since the 60s, has been parallel compression. It's a standard go-to tool on vocals, drums, bass, guitar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting. It's fantastic. So, um, yeah. I got I got a couple of things go here. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I've been so, talking long enough. You know, you've you mentioned the, th- the threshold knob on on a lot of these, and so we've got two. We've got a, 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 I would say, what's the Wampler like? About a buck fifty, something uh, like that. I wanted to say one ninety nine. One ninety nine. So two forty nine. So your Wampler, let's say, let's say it's a two hundred dollar pedal. The one that I have right here, um, because I was hesitant to say, like, I really need this, and I was like, I think I need this, so I wasn't totally committed to dropping a bunch of dough on it. And this one's from Mono Price. Um, I think it works pretty well. I I have played around with it. I have toyed around with it. It probably does. The the, the Dynacomp that it's emulating is a very easy circuit yeah. to rip off. So this one was thirty six bucks. So I, I say that for two reasons. One, because like you you don't. Is it safe to say that you probably don't have to uh, drop a ton, especially if you? Well, I'm the wrong guy to ask about that because right. I'm a compression snob. Okay. Uh, of all the things I'm a snob about, compression's the number one thing. So okay. Uh, for me, uh, you just have access to more ways to control yeah, your compression on that. More ways to control it, and every compressor is going to have a little bit different. Right, but tone. If, if you if you're if you're starting out and you're just getting you're starting to gig and get stuff, a Dynacomp. Right, yeah, you just get an, that's get what a, I'm saying. Like a clone, a low entry, you're you're okay with. My the other point that I'm bringing up is that so like the this has a single knob that says compression or comp. It also has a volume knob and an EQ knob. We've been talking about threshold as the controller of where you're placing that ceiling mm-hmm. on on your the volume. Anything louder than this, right. turn it down. The compression knob on here. So if somebody goes and gets one of these or or another mini pedal, maybe that a single knob or something like that a main knob it might say compression on it that's really the threshold yes essentially okay. and threshold it, and compression it, depends. Are it, it might be a combination of the several things it might be uh it might when you turn it threshold up, and gain it might be threshold gain and it might even be ratio it might it might have a third thing okay where it's actually increasing the ratio um all the more reason to play with it exactly and, yeah so and I, I think that the way to think about this is um if your head is spinning and you're thinking boy this sounds interesting he said all music in the past 30 years has used compression in some on some form uh i'm trying to build a house without a hammer um maybe i should get a hammer and start playing around with it mm-hmm. it's it's an artistic tool like anything else it's like having a different brush right that you can paint with so the the thing to do is to get yourself in a scenario where you can experiment with it in a controlled environment, which I think a looper pedal is the best way to do that. Yeah. Loop up some different guitar parts, and then after the looper pedal, take your output of your looper, plug that in the input of your compressor, and start to turn it up. Yeah, and one of the last bands I was in, uh, the rhythm guitar player, he he ran sound for uh, some large local acts, and he said, dude, you have to get a compressor if I'm going to be in a band with you. You just have to do it. You ha- you have to regulate your volume, and it's like salt. It's like if if a chef said, "Oh, I don't like to use salt." Like, what the hell are you talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah, like and it. It's an essential um, brush in he, your arsenal. He sold me that basic rack mount uh, compressor, and I I loved him for it. Mm. So, so yeah, get yourself a compressor if you don't have one. I think um, it, it, even if you. Uh, don't have one or aren't quite able to buy one, but you have like GarageBand or something. Yeah, I've learned a ton about compression. Um, you know, you doing that on the master on the master track setting, um, just understanding how these things affect and what it's doing. So if you don't have a looper pedal and you don't, you can have, do it in GarageBand. You, you, yeah. you can toy around with it in GarageBand. You definitely won't hurt or anything. Or Mixcraft if you're a Windows user. It's like five bucks. Yeah. Same thing. Ish. Um, so uh, I think 
maybe one or two more questions, Jeff, do you have? So since we're talking a little bit more about recording in general, a limiter versus a compressor, are they one and the same or are they? Essentially, yes. A, a limiter um, in the strictest sense has an attack of zero. Um, and Which means it just goes on. It immediately, immediately. goes on. Um, most limiters are a little slower than that. Um, and a ratio of infinity. So as soon as something hits the threshold, for every uh, dB of additional gain past the threshold, no additional volume is added. Mm -hmm. So your ratio is essentially infinity to zero. So I could add an additional 100 decibels, which would be ridiculous, after the threshold. Anything after that is only going to go up zero. Or uh, in the real world, it would probably be more like 0.1 or mm -hmm. 0.5 or something like that. Um, but there are side effects. Um, as you're going to hear the robot working, turning up and down and not doing it quickly enough or doing it too quickly or... Uh, it's a fat, lazy robot. It's a fat, lazy robot. Or when they begin to release it, um, that's the release knob, um, you might hear it get way louder, which is where the infinite sustain comes in. So I'm going to imitate... Um, I'm going to do kind of the envelope thing again. I'm going to imitate limiting. So if if the threshold is set pretty low... Um, so you're going to limitate. I'm going to limitate. <laughs> so like if the note... I'm going to go, it's just... Bah, and then I want to limit it, but the threshold is below that... Uh, then it might sound like... Bah. But compression can get weird um, when it begins to release... Um, so if it's ba 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 ba, you might end up getting ba ba ba. So you have to experiment with that. But I want to encourage everybody: see it as an artistic tool. It's something that you can get different textures with. Get yourself in a scenario whether that's a loop on GarageBand where you start with the threshold at zero, which would be as loud as it can possibly go in the digital realm, and then slowly begin to turn it down and just listen or whether you loop it up and mm -hmm. begin to just turn that compressor up and, and So that, that to last it. thing you just gave an example, is that what they would call pumping? Yes, exactly. Okay. So bad compression makes the music sound like this. Right, and, uh, which could be a fun effect if you want It can to be, and some EDM styles, yeah. that's what they're going for. Um, that's a whole other story, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think another really good way to illustrate this is that, like, if you're listening to a podcast, hopefully ours. Well, I mean, that would be the only way you would hear this. But, um, you know, <laughs> you can sometimes when you hear stuff and you're just like, man, this just it sounds bad. You may not even be realizing it sounds bad. You just don't like it. But then when you hear something that has like it's like, oh, they paid attention to to getting all the levels right. The levels may not even be right, but it's just not great, allowing it yeah. to be so radically jumping up and down. And a great example of that would be NPR. NPR's compression is balling as far as, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> and I'm Terry Gross. first and only time <laughs> yeah. that's ever been uttered by a human. Well, they're just so thick and so wide yeah. and so controlled, and that's yes. their engineer... Is very good. Yeah. Hmm. No, I, I, I get that. I understand that. I would also say that in a live scenario, you know, um, a band that maybe doesn't have a ton of experience or doesn't have all the right gear, you listen to them and you're just like, it, it just, it sounds all over the place. messy and a little bit all over the place. And, and they could be great players. But then you can hear another band and the, what what's the thing we say? It's like, oh, they sounded tight. Tight. Now, there's being in the pocket, working together tight, but there, there's also... What is like the, the sonic dynamic that's coming at you and is it chaotic or is it like this nice wave yeah. hitting you? So it's well, probably a combination of the sound guy as well as the band playing together and hearing themselves play. Yeah. Right? Well, and understanding true. How, they, how, they, how they sound Yeah, I'm not together. saying that's all because of a compression pedal, but I am, but... With drums, it usually, it's usually is. So... A drummer doesn't sound tight without compression. When we think of what good drums sound like, we're thinking of compressed drums. Right. All of us are thinking of compressed drums yeah. for rock or pop. So or when drums are being mic'd on the board, there's compression They're happening. using compression, and they're using it 
th to control the envelope a lot of the kick drum so that instead of bump 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 it's poof, 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 so that it's punchy right so i would say and i think i think this is a maybe a good spot to transition you know like uh compression is a robot it is artificially intelligent in that you give it parameters and say within these parameters do a b c and d here's if this situation happens then respond in this way um it's like an automatic thermostat it is it is like a thermostat that's a perfect illustration and i think for i know a lot of people are hesitant to get into compression and to use compression because it's mysterious but because it's artificially intelligent um in the it's it's an analog device that's artificially intelligent because it makes uh, decisions given the parameters that you give it. There's a great story I read in, I'm gonna go s total full nerd on you guys here. Mm. So I love, uh, one of my favorite authors is Walter Isaacson. He wrote the Steve Jobs bio, and he wrote a book recently called um, The Innovators, talking about artificial intelligence and compressors, stay with me here. And uh, he says, uh, he talked about this chess tournament in 2006 in the end of the book, and he said it was human chess players versus computers versus human computer teams. And, you know, IBM's Watson, we're sitting in a, this is an IBM office-ish, sort of. Yeah, it's owned it, by I IBM. Mean, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, I don't see any logos. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. supposed to say that. Anyways. I don't know. <laughs> so, like, IBM's Watson Ibum. is going to beat... Uh, Gary Kasparov, you know, a, a, or any chess champion, they're going to crush him. And in 2006, that happened. But then an interesting thing happened. The human computer team, so it was like mediocre chess players with laptops, letting the laptops help them crunch numbers and stuff, absolutely demolished even the supercomputers at chess. Mm -hmm. Because a human's artistic ability combined with the machine's ability to basically you know, outsource some of your decision making to a machine, that's a really intense combo right there. Like when Ron Weasley played the chess game of his life. Right. And <laughs> or when uh beat the board. When Robocop goes up against a bad guy, he's, you know, a human but also making decisions. That might that, that's not accurate. He's fully computer, isn't he's, he? No, I don't think so. Anyways, he's when, more human than human. When you've got like a, a human that's augmented by a machine's intelligence, right? That's a that's an intense. So a cyborg thing, a cyborg. Compressors make you into cyborgs mm. as guitar players. Oh my! So uh, yeah, you don't have to think as much. And to your comment, Jeff, it makes it easier to play guitar. You don't have to think about your volume as much if you've told the compressor these are the this is the right scenario in order to make those decisions. And most compressor pedals make that very easy. It's either too much compression or it's not enough compression on a, a Dynacomp or, right. a, or a clone. Is so, that really gonna impact you if you're on a solid state then? Because you're not gonna be getting those necessary like swells from loss of headroom like you would on a... Um, it's gonna help. It's gonna help. It's gonna okay. help no matter what. Um, so... But, it may, but it's... Based on how you set up, like the original is like on a tube amp, you have much more dynamic range when it comes to that on a solid state. When volume says X, it's X. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like it's, and that's back into the gain staging topic of um, if the compressor is helping you, um, you know, you're playing a rhythm part and the compressor is helping you stay in that sweet spot on the yeah. amp. Um, whether that's helping you distort the amp in a more predictable, more consistent way, or that that's just making you sound tighter as a player, um, it's going to help. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm, you know, I'm biased, but I think there are very few scenarios in music where some compression, if it's not compressed at all, is not at least a little bit helpful, and allows you to focus on other things like the right note and the time that you play that note. So, yeah, if you can drop out 30% of what you have to do as a musician, or it's, and that's really not it, it's probably more like 5 or 10%, it's going to make you play better. Cool. That's a great way to wrap that up. That was solid. Um, yes. Man, okay, so that's a, lot of, that's a lot of stuff to think about. So I encourage all the listeners to listen to that a few times. <laughs> so I think we, we have to decide, is it called compression or not? 
Back yeah, to the, see, do we, the original thing is, is like... Is compression a good... A good is compression is it, a really good... Is it I would love to hear what you guys out there who are listening, maybe we'll make that a poll. Is compression... Uh, I'll, I, I'll throw that out there. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, it it's doesn't a, sound right, like... It's a, sh- it's a shortened name. It's act- I, I think the pro- appropriate and probably original term was dynamic compression okay so mm. dynamic is in louder notes quieter notes compression and that's really when you talk about compression if you call it dynamic compression it makes more sense to me. it makes a lot more all right sense. i'm gonna throw one little wrench in here <laughs> then why is it not a normalizer that's a, that's a conversation for another day i think normal okay. normal normalization uh makes your peak volume consistent from file to file to file not really compression because mm-hmm. it doesn't deal with dynamics. It just deals with peak volume. Okay. All right. So that's a lot for everybody to think about. But bottom line, get yourself a little compressor. Start small. You can get, you know, uh, lots of lots of entry level priced models and and then all the crazy ones up to like, you know, the Keeley and you know, what we saw over. Yeah. And even know. if you have a rack mount compressor hanging around, um, that can be a great thing, you know. Get a, get your looper pedal out, loop a rhythm section or a lead section, and then plug it into a rack mount box, and then yeah. plug the output of the rack mount box into an amp or a speaker, and just start goofing around. Mm-hmm. Um, start at zero on the threshold, and then begin to slowly turn it down, or all the way to the left on a guitar pedal, and just experiment. Move slowly, and you know, get it. And, and let me say this one last thing. I think. Um, to be able to use an audio tool like compression or EQ or anything well, it comes down to you take the piece of gear that you have, you put yourself in a scenario that you would use it in, and you know if I turn this knob to 12 o'clock in your head, you can anticipate what that will sound like. Once you can do that with a compressor pedal, you will be able to use it in an artistic scenario and Mm -hmm. as a tool. So Cool. All right, top four. Ding, 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 ding. I don't know what that. I just that's did a bell. That, this that was a bell. I was like, time to fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's the first thing you thought of, and not dinner. But um, <laughs> uh, all right, our top four is. Um, let me see if I can get this right. I got compression in my head. Um, it is uh, our. Uh, non-traditional guitar body style of choice all right all right and jared stomping at the bit go bc rich bitch mm-hmm. oh yeah, so one. yeah so when i was a kid i couldn't afford good guitars because i was really young that was back then that was a that, that was, was like a the top really line those were really expensive right then, there right. there it is yeah which I, one which one there's so many it was black and it had a lightning bolt pattern this older fella that uh i would hang out with that's and the, wait, we played which one and jammed. You in, talk, are you sure it's the bitch and not the warlock? You know what? Maybe it's 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 the uh, the bitch. The bitch has that huge cutout on the upper on the upper uh, shoulder. It maybe it is the warlock. I'm sorry, it is a warlock. No, that's not a war. That's not it. Yeah, yeah. I think you're talking about the warlock. The bitches were really big. I think in the late '70s. That's when they were like ruling the school. Yes, the warlock. That's that's the one. My right. a friend of mine loaned me that, and it had the lightning bolt pattern on it, and uh, it was. I thought it was really cool because it was, you know, heavy metal ish, and it, yeah, it was really different. A lot of points, pointies. And, uh, eh, yeah, I I just I barely had any guitar effects though, so it didn't really. It just sounded clean most of the time. I mean, I yeah. my dad had this old JVC tape deck. That I would plug it in and t- and turn the input input volume all the way up. I used it as a gain. Yeah, probably sounded. I think kind of Mick cool. Mars was using those yeah. one of those early on, I, as I recall. Hmm. So that's my choice, man. Just just because of sentimental reasons. Okay, Chris, I um for a long time had a K Starburst, and Ooh, it was essentially yeah, okay. what's a K, how do you spell K A Y K A Y. It was essentially an Explorer combined with a flying V. Yeah, and, really goofy. Um, I don't even know if you'll very be able to extreme. find it. Very, no, they, uh, they come up on uh, they come up on 
uh, Craigslist often, believe it or not. There, I've seen quite a few. I sold mine on Craigslist a few years ago to Josh of Tiger Tree, um, <laughs> a delightful individual with a wonderful store. Okay. Uh, okay. I think it's just called the Star. Is it the Star? I think it's just called Star. Um, I'll know it if I see it. I don't see it. There it is. Oh yeah! yeah. Oh man! That yeah, thing it's was like so a, it's weird. literally like a Z. Like, a, and it had a huge. Mine had a uh, a really like vintage '70s Fender style headstock. So just that huge circle at the tip of the the headstock. Yeah, and it you know added like all this extra weight to it. It was single single humbucker, never meant to be played clean. Let me ask you something. Did did K? <laughs> That was the fastest. Did did K, Let me ask you something. Did Kay copy know. off a of Dean or did Dean copy off a of K? I would say probably Dean off a of K because Dean's a lot newer. K has been around right. for well, millions I mean, of years. Dean's, yeah. Dean's been doing it since the 70s. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So please, somebody answer that and put it in the comments. Um, there's... Uh, yeah, that, that we, we're gonna have to find that out. You know, now, it probably now, was great. K. K copied for a living. That's what they did. Right? K, I believe, it was not okay. <laughs> oh man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just <laughs> accidentally you did just it just again. Lost another pepperoni. <laughs> I thought that was gonna okay, cost um, me a piece. <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, we'll have to dig into that. Who, which came first, the, uh, the Dean uh, or the K? Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, everybody was copying. There was a, there was a time i mean you're bringing the tysco and all and all that stuff is like copy city right yep um i think k used to was the am i wrong about that i think k and they, harmony kind of they bought the kalamazoo like factory the, when yeah. gibson got rid of it yeah um hefe what do you got mine's not as extreme as these guys but i really like the uh the wolfgang style guitar mm, okay yeah great yeah. Yeah, boring. <laughs> what? I mean, I guess that's it's, it's that's, like I said, it's not extreme. Yeah. But as far as like a that isn't like that introducing a new guitar extreme. style yeah. to the world. Okay, I, I gotcha. I, I thought it was a, a nice minimalist, unique looking guitar. Okay. Is that what Brian May uses? PV, right? Yeah, PV made those. PV right. made them for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, Brian May doesn't. No, Brian May he uses his red his red special. That's, he made with his dad. Ball? That's it. Yeah. Ernie Ball. He actually yeah, handmade that with his dad. The that's, first one. Yeah. Kind of amazing. So was it Ernie yeah. Ball that made him first, or was it PV that made him first? I think it was Ernie Ball. I can't remember. I have to look. Yeah. The Wolf Gang. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't remember. Yeah, I mean, there was a switch right in the middle. Yeah. Um. Anyways, we were running long, so I got to wrap this up. So mine's definitely. I was going to say Flying V because I think Flying Vs are pretty rad. But if I had a flying choice of a Flying V or an Explorer, I'm going to take the Explorer. I love it. I, it's just so freaking cool. And, and James Hetfield kind of ruined. No. That's, <laughs> that's but it's, so it's kind of interesting because obviously, I mean, the Explorer had been around f- since the late, late 50s. Late 50s, yeah. Right? Yeah. Interestingly enough, the, chrono ones the too. war of like, who exactly did um, come up with that? And huh. uh, the fellow that actually created the um, uh, the humbucker, anybody, Seth Lever. anyone, Seth Lever, um, credits himself with coming up. He mm. said that he he uh, told uh, the name is escaping me. The other fellow, I want to say it's Montgomery. It's not Montgomery. Hmm. Arr, I can't remember his name, but the 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 head of design, the actual head of design, Seth Miller wasn't a head of, head of design, but the actual head of design at Gibson at the time, um, uh, in an interview, Seth Miller was saying how he said we should do one that kind of looks like a a, a half crushed beer can, <laughs> and that's and, and he's also cr- semi credited for coming up with the flying V huh. because. He said, "I want to. We should make a guitar that you, when you when you lean it against something, it won't fall over." That's nice. like actually what he said. And nice. then they came up with the flying feet. <laughs> Anyways, you know <laughs> that's can't hold. that's all debatable in history now. But it does look really fifties-y if if you 
kind of reorient it can. yourself. It's got it like can a, look a fifties. Well, yeah, thing look at the on. the long points, like the the fishtail, yeah, yeah. fishtail, an that automobile. Car, and that's what I like, like about that. that is that you can either you can either you know retro them to original or. You know, I mean, I grew up when the only person playing an Explorer was James Hetfield. Yeah. You know, at least in my world. And when, you know, when he's knees back, you know, or knees forward, back, leaning back on that thing, just powering away, it's like, there's nothing more badass than that, right? Back uh, then, at the time. There was a Leonard, you know, Leonard Skinner guitar day, player, yeah. actually. <laughs> Leonard Skinner had actually used Explorer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of those guys. I bought one. What's his name? Sorry, I, like I can't it. remember. Anyway, so there it is. Oh, man. Uh, so much stuff. We could just keep going on and on and on. But that's why we have more episodes. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, Chris, for um, hooking this up. Well, yeah, but then he went to ESP. and Yeah. I mean, I guess he was always with ESP, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, I'm not... Yeah, I'm See, man, Side I was track. just about to do <laughs> that. And then track. I saw the picture of him with his ESP up there. All right. Thank you, Chris for dumping all that compression on us. My pleasure. And squishing our brains and our listeners' brains. And thank you everyone for listening and sticking with us. This is a little bit long, but we appreciate it and hope you like it, hope you dig it. And I'm going to use a compressor for this. Subscribe! <laughs> well, that's it for these knobs. Please join us on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash guitar knobs. And tell us what you think and share your stories and guitar stuff along with ours. You can also find us at twitter.com forward slash guitar underscore knobs and also at our website at guitarknobs.podbean.com. 